next week's test, you know, you'll just have to get a one year exemption. Yeah. So I had to pay for an exemption, yeah. essentially buying a license. A temporary for a license. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So you basically give them enough money, like you're buying a license, but you don't take the test. And they go, for one year, you can practice because we know you have a certification. And I ended up at the end of that year sitting down for the test. I remember sitting down in this auditorium looking around and you know, no offense, but they were all young like mm -hmm. you. And yeah. I was like, wow, look at all these young kids. <laughs> and this girl goes, hey, remember me? And I was like, no, I'm sorry. I don't <laughs> I'm on the ambulance crew at the stadium for the Dynamo games. <laughs> oh my God. And I was like, oh, hey, how are you? <laughs> wow. I was like, wow, this is weird. I'm taking the same exam as a girl graduating <laughs> from college. <laughs> It just it blew me away. I That's just awesome. I didn't get it, you know. Yeah, no, I still don't. It was, it was <laughs> funny. Though. It was it was pretty funny. So, <laughs> well, we've actually had the conversation. The reason was because the Texas license existed before the DOC did. Mm -hmm. Is that what it is? And that's why. Okay. So athletic training was regulated in Texas before the DOC. And so I always figured it was. Uh, Good old Texas. This is my 40 years. <laughs> this is, this is, we'll do it our own Leave way. me alone. I'm going to do what I want. Right. I'm, that too. I'm just a man on my horse. Don't tell me what to do. <laughs> At least they've made it now where you don't have to take the test. I know. I saw that. And I was uh, like, national oh, like when, uh, my new assistant came in. He's like, yeah, I don't have to take the test. I can just show him my card and, yeah. and get my license. Well, it should I was be. Like, man. Yeah. He, he went to a master's degree in Texas, but it didn't. At that time, he was already certified. So it didn't. Don't even know. Do you guys have to sit for the no, LAGA exam? No, it's like automatic now. Yeah, if you pass the BOC, yeah. then you're good to go. Mm -hmm. okay. You just show them in. Yeah. It's weird. There he is. What's up, Bobby? Hey, Darren. How's it going? Good, man. <laughs> so it's actually live right now, so y'all can just, just so I can capture the conversation that you're already having. Okay. So you can just continue. My students will be here in probably the next four minutes. Awesome. So then once we once we get them all in the set, then we'll just then we'll begin the formal show. But gotcha. Yeah. So, How's the off season, Bobby? It's pretty good, man. I uh, it's been it's been rough for the last few weeks. I was in I was in Vegas the end of this past week and Barbados two weeks before that. So it's been pretty decent. What? Nice off season. <laughs> Yeah, I, I've been training off season because we didn't make playoffs, so that's finally done. Right. So I'm actually in my off season this week. Yeah, you get what, what a three weeks and then back at it. Uh, yeah, you know how it goes. I mean, we'll we'll get started <laughs> preseason uh, January twenty second, something like that. So right. got a little bit more time because we didn't make the playoffs, but you know how it is. There's always meetings, and I was mm -hmm. in today cleaning up and organizing and just getting ready for the next year. So yeah. Yeah, I just got the word that I got to go to Atlanta for a combine. Oh wow! Yeah, you can check out the uh, the new home of Atlanta United, huh? Yeah, go check them out. Nice. So you uh, doing a uh, ice hockey coverage now too? Uh, yeah, I am. I'm working with uh, the College of Charleston. Just nice. uh, just doing game coverage. I'm not doing anything practice wise. But, That's uh, not through the hospital, is it? Is that independent? <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, it's, uh, it's through the hospital. This is why I didn't do it from home either. Say, is that your alarm system going off right there? Exactly. My neighbor's getting his mail, and I have a, a one and a half year old lab, and she's not happy. <laughs> I don't know if you guys can see her. Oh, gorgeous. <laughs> okay. No. I have a very, uh, I know we're talking about injuries today anyways, but I have a very active dog. He's about five and he like has to go to the dog park because he's just crazy. He'll drive you crazy if he doesn't. He tore his ACL. Yeah. So oh, I'm like, no. is that, is that really, that's crazy. And a go figure an athletic trainer's dog. So we just uh, fixed it and he's rehabbing now. He's getting to go up and down stairs for rehab and he gets to run a walk jog one to two minutes. Nice. I'm like this is ridiculous. But is that a couple grand for that? Yeah, yeah. About Amazing how expensive that can be. Mm -hmm. right. And that was the cheap procedure. So uh, this seems to be the better one. It, it's more ACL like, like, uh, like humans. It's got the, the rope that goes through the other one. They just, they want to charge me four thousand bucks, and they wanted to shave his fem uh, his femur or tib tib down, um, and not really put anything in there to to rope it together. I'm like, well, that doesn't make much sense. So we did this rope tight yeah. rope. Yeah, you can't pull that one over on yeah, the I'm like, Yeah, yeah. No, I'm like, yeah. That one doesn't More really money. seem exactly. like it's gonna work. So yeah, so we love our puppies. Hello. Hi. Do you have 
y'all have Twitter? I do. Mm -hmm. Can I have yours? Thank you so much. Uh, I think you put mine on the sheets at Soccer Sports Med for Theron. Okay, okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And oh, at BWWATC. That's Bobby on That's the uh, yeah. Skype. Okay, okay. And John? I don't know what mine is. You don't use your yeah. Twitter every moment of every day. No. <laughs> you hang out with college students I guess every day. <laughs> you, that's how they communicate. The only thing I do is I follow all of our scores. Like I, I follow Rice Baseball or Rice Football <laughs> when they're playing, and then I can get like up to date. Yeah, that's about it. That's so bad. I feel like sometimes I should just put messages on Twitter to talk to my guys as get, opposed to texting them. Oh, right, get a faster response. I might. I might. So mine oh, is. Sorry, it's Snapchat now. Oh, yeah. Is that the cool thing? I um, refuse. So mine, Absolutely so refuse. <laughs> Mine's D Stucky 32. So D S T U C K E Y 32. 32? Mm -hmm. That's it. D Stucky 32. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Nothing creative there. Sorry. <laughs> I'm lucky I have one. So. <laughs> I don't even use mine. No. 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 <laughs> Snapchat? Mm, a little. Yeah. I'm just like not into it. So is this lunch hour for you students or is this actual class time? Class. Is it? Okay. Mm -hmm. It was lunch earlier? Wow. How early do you start school? Uh, 7.15. So then when was lunch? I'm glad I'm uh, done with high school. We have three lunches. <laughs> that was the last lunch, so we need to become. Be starving by 2 o'clock. Exactly. Eat, eat lunch at 10.30 or something? 10.30, 11? <laughs> I'm in a control room at NASA. <laughs> it's maybe more complicated than the control room at NASA. I don't, I don't even understand how they can do this all. You're doing a great job by even getting all these wires hooked up. I like to say I work with humans, not computers. So. Thank goodness. Me. Yeah. yeah. There's a lot going on. There is a lot going on. I um. Yep. There you go. You can see my new shirt. Uh, Dan just like gave it. this to me today. <laughs> Are everybody ready in your spots? I think I've started. Josh, both of yours are started. Yes. All good over there. All right, here we go in three, two, one. What's up, y'all? Welcome to the Sports Medicine Broadcast, How to Treat and Manage Injuries in Soccer, number 192. We have Theron Inns on Twitter. He's at Soccer Sports Med. He is the head athletic trainer for the Houston Dynamo, the major league soccer team here in Houston. And we have on Skype or on uh, on the computer there, it was Bobby Weissenberger, and that's BWWATC on Twitter. He is the head athletic trainer for the uh, Charleston Battery. Now, real quick, Darren, whenever I looked on the Dynamo site, it said the Charleston Battery on that same site. Was that just because they're both MLS? Uh, or is that they were our minor league affiliate this year okay. so uh, we would send players down to them and we've also taken a look at some of their players uh so for this year we were partnered with them as a kind of like a like baseball like a minor league affiliate yeah that's what i that's what i thought but i was just checking to make sure and then you can see dawn and probably her big belly she's pregnant dawn stucky the <laughs> athletic trainer at rice for the rice owls women's soccer team so we're gonna be talking about injuries in soccer and best practices best ways to deal with uh, injuries in soccer since soccer season is coming up pretty soon i think they have tryouts here in the high school at pasadena and next week some i know some areas of the country they're already ending soccer or you know state playoffs that kind of thing but here we're just now starting it up so um where are you where are you hey i'm your host jeremy jackson sitting right beside me i've got Daniela. 
Joshua. Jasmine. Cooper. Tiana. And then joining us from the University of Houston, Masters of Athletic Training Program. April. April. Perez. April Perez. Because <laughs> one day you're going to be like, oh, I see that is me right there. Yeah. So you, you can put it on your resume. If you want to join the conversation, sportsmedicinebroadcast.com is streaming live there. If you want the CEU credit, you got to log in using hashtag DSMB, Juanita and Nelly are chasing that on Twitter. So ask your questions there or when you're logged in in the chat. Um, Jasmine, can you read those people that are logged in in the chat there? Rob. Christy, John, Rachel, John, Israel, and Alexandra. All right, so shout out to everybody there in the chat. Make sure you get your questions in there, and we will do our best to get them answered. Without much further ado, we're going to get right to our guests. And Daniela, who are we going to start with? Um, All right, we'll start with Bobby because he's on the left from what I'm looking at. So, Daniela. Okay, Bobby, why did you choose to work soccer? Uh, I grew up as a soccer player, so that's kind of how I got into sports medicine from being uh, injured all the time. So I, I kind of wanted to stick with soccer. It's just always been the sport I've enjoyed. Don, you're next. Um, I actually had no soccer experience um, growing up. I played basketball, um, but I covered soccer um, a few times during the years of my 10 years at Rice. And I really loved the um, the excitement, the contact. Um, the girls that we play with are very energetic and outgoing. So I really liked our atmosphere and team. So uh, when I had a chance, I switched over to soccer about three three years ago. So. And then we also talked about how that benefits you now because your husband's a football coach at a high school. Right. Definitely. And so your seasons are the same. So now you're off at the same time. He's off roughly. Yes, that's right. So yeah, we uh, we have the same busy time, and then we're slow at the same time. We're in basketball. Um, he's busy. Where I'm slow, and then I'm still going all the way until March. And um, so we didn't really see each other very much. So it was actually a, a good career move that way too. Very cool. And Darren, uh, I got into soccer. I was actually leaving an internship in the NFL, um, and I wanted to stay in pro sports. Um, so there were some opportunities out there. Um, and I actually took a job as an assistant athletic trainer and an <coughs> equipment manager. I had a dual role when I first started. Um, I always grew up playing the sport. I always loved it. In fact, I remember watching the world cup while I was interning in the NFL and guys were like giving me grief that we were watching <laughs> soccer in the training room. Um, but always loved the sport when the opportunity came around, I jumped on it and, uh, 17 years later, I'm still doing it. So, all right. Very cool. Uh, April, what are the most common preventable injuries you see in soccer? Um, preventable? Let's see. You, it's really hard to tell because they are cutting and, and running in different directions and you can't really control it. Um, I would, you can prevent the knee, but you would have to strengthen. You'd have to incorporate um, a whole strengthening program for the other muscles to prevent knee injuries. Like you, you just said you saw three ACL injuries yeah, in one season. in yeah mm -hmm. in one year. Do you think possible to prevent them? Actually, I wish I could have prevented those yeah. three last year, but um, <laughs> yeah, that is that is definitely something we deal with a lot of lower extremity injuries. Mm -hmm. uh, so any injury prevention it, for us is focused, you know, from the waist down. I like to joke. Um, that's, that's pretty much the area of the body that we deal with. Mm -hmm. So, uh, our number one injury actually is, is hamstring strain still. It sounds like a, a common injury and you would think that they wouldn't have it cause they're not running athletes, but they do more running than they do kicking. So hamstrings is something that I wish we could prevent even more because it's, uh, ever so common. And, uh, it's one of those, uh, things that is small, but it stops them from playing. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. We do a lot of um, balance, you know, proprioceptive feedback stuff, um, balancing, um, jumping off one leg, especially for female sports. We have a higher incident um, occurrence of, you know, possible ACLs. So we do a lot of jumping program, um, strengthening, of course, the quad and hamstring um, and balance um, and then contact jumping. So we'll go up against each other and learn how to land when you come down from contact because it's, it's a very, very big contact sport with a lot of, um, you know, headers and contact in the midfield, stuff like that. So. All right, Bobby, same question. Most common preventable injuries in your opinion? I have to agree with Aaron. I mean, because that's the, the muscle injuries are the worst for, for us. I mean, they're, they're, you can prevent them with good strengthening programs. And, you know, I had, I had made a spreadsheet a few years ago that tracks every single injury that we have and how much time they were out and hamstring strain was 
the, the leader every year. So we put, uh, we put the culprits that we had problems with on a good uh, strengthening and flexibility program. And they actually uh, went from one player who made maybe three or four games in a season because he just had constant hamstring strains out four to five weeks every time and then to rehab back. So a after putting that player on the strengthening program, we, we made it through uh, the last two seasons with uh, really one hamstring strain for that one individual player. But as, a, as overall for the group, we, we had maybe three or four hamstring strains uh, last season that were uh, kind of hamstringing us a little bit to, to, to use that term. But uh, it, I mean, it's that, that's, that's the biggest thing is, uh, you know, strengthening and flexibility program for uh, the muscle injuries. All right. Um, one of the things you know, we were discussing before we started the, the show, I think I'd already started the recording, was that, Darren, that some of your guys will go to, like you said, Honduras, play and get hurt over there, and then they come back over here and have to treat you. So how much in, at the professional or college level do you see the soccer players doing things like you know, putting – Vicks uh, vapor rub on injuries and assuming that it's going to help. Does it, does that carry over to the professional level or at that point do they realize this, that's not really what works? Superstitions are at every level. Um, we've got guys that have grown up, you know, just doing certain things and they've got their approach. Uh, we we're rather unique in that we have people from different cultures as well. I've got <laughs> players from Africa. I've got players from central America, I've got players from Europe and they all come with their own background of what they like and what they think works. So, we try to spend a, a you know a lot of time educating our players on how we treat injuries and and kind of the, I won't call it the American philosophy but just our team's philosophy of how we treat injuries and it does take a little bit of convincing. There's some guys that don't believe in what you're doing or they want a specific modality versus another one, even though current science doesn't prove that that ultrasound is going to heal your hamstring. They may still want that, you mm -hmm. know. So um, there's always an educational component to it, um, but superstitions are very hard to overcome because mentally they think I've always done it this way. It's going to get me better again. So we, we try to incorporate that in, uh, you know, I believe in do no harm as long as it's something neutral, as, as long as it's not anything crazy, I'll, I'll let them, you know, do what they like to do, but we're going to still try and use the, the knowledge that we have to get them better. Gotcha. All right, Don, what do you think? College level girls? Um, for female, um, college we don't have um a ton of international um athletes we have a few from canada every year and um i think they're more on track with um kind of how we do things here in the states anyway so um it hasn't been very difficult for our transition um when i worked at tyler junior college um i worked with their men's program and there was um we had several international athletes and and it was definitely the you know spray cold spray on it and they're you know they're better in two minutes and stuff like that so i think just just how he said with the internationals it's just convincing them um that you know um a, a, a direct approach or approach from every side is is uh is a good way to handle it but we don't really have that issue too much with my team anyways we don't have that many international athletes any different thoughts there bobby uh, it's the same thing i had a few players that would use flexol and thinking that just because it felt warm that it meant they were warmed up and it's 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 an education thing all right so one of the things i think we see most is ankle sprains um you know, obviously we see hamstrings and groin, those kind of things as well. But uh, Tiana wants to know. How can we prevent them? So who are you going to start with, Tiana? April. Um, <laughs> ankle sprains, the same with every other injury, the incorporating proprioception, balance, um, neuromuscular, if you don't know what that is, that's you have them, you can have them balance on like a, a Therix pad and then throw a ball at them or have them kick it and they don't know which direction it's coming from. So they can incorporate all like their little intrinsic muscles inside their foot. Um, anything else? Uh, I agree. Uh, anything that is a, a functional sports specific type rehab, um, you obviously want a base of <clears throat> strength that you're going to do while they're sitting on the table as they're just coming back initially from their injury, but then as soon as you can get them up on their feet and they can start getting into a single leg stance, balancing on unable sur unstable surfaces, just like April talked about, any of those things that challenge the athlete, because you got to remember that once they get back on the field, it's an uncontrolled environment. They're, you're not going to be go, oh, slow down, don't 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 run at me, you know, I, my ankles hurt. They've got to be able to do whatever's required of them. So the more challenging you can make the rehab in the in the training room or in the weight room 
the better off they're going to be once they're back on the field. Yeah, definitely. I I think that covers it. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Bobby, you got to give me something different. <laughs> something different. Um, I would say I, I, Theron and I have a little more control over our players than that. You know, we we have this this small group that you know, we kind of rule over. But I think you know, at the high school level, these guys are these 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 players can be playing in multiple teams, and so I think proper rehabilitation after the injury could prevent further injury. And that that's what I saw a lot when I worked at the high school level was they would get injured, do one to two weeks of rehab, and then return. Where at, at our level, Theron and I are not letting those players back on the field until we know they're at full strength. All right, so educating them on rehab. So again, for, like, sure. for me, it comes back to superstition. I had a kid come in. Oh, I'm just going to go to to the Mexican doctor, and she's going to fix my knee. Well, if you get <laughs> patella femoral pain, it's not going to just put some hands on it with some, you know, salve on there. So it's just, how do I break through to those? Uh, break those cultural barriers or whatever to, to show them or to convince them. And so that's something hopefully you guys can enlighten me. Hopefully we can go through, uh, do that. So, all right. Okay. Bobby, what are some best practices for rehabbing soccer injuries? Uh, it really depends on which injury we're talking about. Um, you just, uh, you just approach it as you, uh, you treat the, uh, the whole athlete. You don't want to just rehab, you know, one specific thing you want to work on, you know, the whole body. You don't want to, it's a cardiovascular fitness. You want to make sure everybody's completely fit to return to play. You just don't want to focus on a left ankle sprain and not worry about uh, what's going on with the rest of the body. My turn. Yep. Um, I agree with that. And, and, you know, we're constantly having them um, cardiovascular train while they're um, doing a, an injury, you know, a rehab injury, uh, bringing it back. I'm sorry. And so even though they may, may not be able to run for an ankle sprain, um, they're in the pool doing some f fitness there on a bike or on our alter G, um, which takes your body weight off, uh, up to 20%. So you can still get a lot of fitness in because if they rest for three weeks with no running, then they can't, they can't just go back day one and expect to start and, you know, play 40 minutes in a soccer game. You've got to make sure that their cardiovascular endurance is still up where they've worked so hard in that preseason to build it. You can't lose that during your rehab. So even though you're doing a lot of ankle TheraBand and, and balance and all that, you have to make sure that you're being creative outside of that area and keeping them cardiovascular fit too. So for us, we don't have a swimming pool. We don't have <laughs> Ultra G. We don't even have a treadmill. Okay. Right, we have a bike. So what are some thoughts there? How am I going to do cardiovascular training for that ankle or hamstring injury with the equipment that we've got? Yeah, that's that's a good challenge for you that I'm blessed that I don't have that issue. But um, you could definitely do some, um, you know, some sprint jogs, I guess you could say on the bike where, um, you know, you warm up. I had an athlete today warm up for 10 minutes at a at about a 70 percent pace just to get a good heart rate. And then um, she did a 10, uh, 30 second sprint as hard as she could go and then 30 second recovery. And we did those for 10 reps and then we um, took a break and then um, did it again. And so she's doing some sprinting on the bike and then she cooled down with another 10 minutes. It's at a, at a lower pace, but still getting a good workout in where, of course, it has to be pain free because that's not helping you if you're if you're causing pain when you're on that bike or doing that. Um, I think you could also do some um, high intensity um, weightlifting probably would um, benefit everything. Um, and you're still going to have um, a, like a high circuit maybe where you're still getting your heart rate up and you're getting um, a lot of lifting in. That's probably good. Or you have to be creative and say, all right, which one of your buddies has a pool at home where you can go do some, you know, lower body jumping in the pool and, um, you know, stuff like that after they're to a certain progression in the ankle program. You have to get creative probably. All right, Darren. I, I'll be honest with you, I think one of the greatest strengths of most athletic trainers is creativity. Mm -hmm. um, you have to figure things out. And I think for a situation where you don't have a lot of equipment, you can't use that as an excuse why you're not trying different things. Um, I've worked at a high school before where you have a bike and that's it and maybe one table. I think Dawn alluded to a, a great idea of do what you can, like upper body lifting or core work, but do it quickly with less rest and that's gonna get their heart rate up. Um, holistically as you're training, you know, the, the other side of this best practices is 
doing whatever you can to strengthen all parts of the body because the ankle is connected to the knee, which is connected to the hip. We, we know that people with ankle problems tend to have other issues in their hip, you know, later on or their knee, other problems that need to be corrected a, as quickly as possible. So for our guys, we, we sit down and talk about what they can't do because of the injury. And then we determine, okay, you can go to the gym and you can do an upper body lift. You can do core workout. You could, you know, in your situation, you could do a, put the bike on top of the table and they can use their hands and do an upper body bike with that bike. You know, we have an upper body bike in our facility so they can sit down and use their arms while their leg doesn't work, but you can adjust things uh, to what you have. And I think um, the, the suggestion of just doing your simple body weight activities rapidly with no rest is great for the cardiovascular while you're allowing the ankle to heal, but there's still, um, you're, you're only as limited as, as your creativity and so anything you can glean, I, I'm not shy. I steal exercises from other people that I come across all the time. I read things on the internet and I go, let's give that a try, you know, and just give it a try. Just keep pushing them. To, you know, just because they're hurt doesn't mean it's not a light switch. It's not shut completely off. There's other things they can do that'll keep them fit and keep them engaged so that they're ready to go once that ankle feels better or whatever injury. All right. Do all three of you feel like all of your athletes are really motivated to return? Because... Because kind of what you're saying is, yeah, I would have to send them over to the weight room to do an upper body workout or, you know, a, a upper body core workout on their own high intensity. But if I'm not standing right there with them, they might or might not do anything. And so ad address that real quick. Um, Darren, we'll start with you. M motivation is it, it's not just at my level. They're all motivated. They're, they're humans, just like the humans that you deal with. There are going to mm -hmm. be days that they're unhappy and they don't want to be there. They're going to be upset that they're injured and separated from the group. That's where we have to come in and, and be that like support and push from behind. Um, it, it does take work. There are days that it, it works great and they're, they're motivated and they're running around and they're raring to go. I've got an athlete who's, who's up and down one day. He's, he's on board. He's ready to go to the gym, to, you know, long-term rehab. He was great on Monday and Tuesday. He's like, yeah, I'm kind of tired. I don't really want to do anything there. You just have to plan for that. Know their personality and, and understand what works for them. Um, it does take a lot of work. It, it's the added part. It's not just planning out the nice little rehab for the knee injury or the, or the groin injury. There does take some personal interaction. This is where I think athletic trainers strength is we're around our athletes. We know them. And so we can find those areas to motivate them and help push them, you know, because that's, that's what we do. We support and, and assist athletes. So, um, it, it takes a little bit of extra work sometimes, but that's what we're here for. Yeah, and I think education, again, we keep going back to that, but, you know, treat the athlete like a normal a normal person and say, you know, this is why we're we're doing this full body workout today and why we, you know, you worked really hard during the preseason. We don't want you to get out of shape and, and not do anything. We, You know, um, if you educate them on why we're doing this and the benefits of it, then a lot of times they're going to be on board and be like, oh, okay, that makes sense. Because a lot of times you, you have to remember they don't, They've never been hurt before and they've never been through that struggle. Um, and you have to just keep encouraging them, um, you know, every day that they're going to have good days and bad days. And you have to tell them that and you'd be like, You're, you might be really sore tomorrow, but we're going to have to come in and, and suck it up and, and get it done. And a lot of times the, um, you know, relating to them on a personal level um, or, you know, educating them a little more helps. Bobby, any different thoughts? No, I mean, I agree with both of them. I, I have both ends of the spectrum. I have the player that will run through the wall every time I tell them, and then I have the player that I have to stand beside and, and kick to get moving. And it's Every team's going to have both ends of that. I don't, I don't know I've ever been a part of a team that every single person was motivated to do everything I told them when I told them to do it. I mean, and it's, it is the education side of it. And, and for me, it, it helped, you know, that's where I used, I got a, ended up getting a psych minor when I was in college. So I used a little, little mind games on them as well. So it, it helps both ways. Uh, what do you like best to treat or prevent cramping, Bobby? What do I like? Um, that's a good question. Um, I don't see it very often. It's, it, you know, I think, I think that comes with 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 fitness and and the elite level. We just don't get it very often. I mean, if if we had to go in the playoffs and play a, a, an overtime game where we're used to playing ninety and we end up at one twenty or at an altitude, which happened to us a couple of years back when we were in Salt Lake City, 
and we weren't ready to play 120 minutes versus an MLS team, and we were cramping like crazy at the end. But as 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 the day day by day goes, we don't have a problem with it. I think you know once at, at, at the level we're at now, I think the athletes realize that you know nutrition and hydration and all they have to keep up with it. We do daily weigh ins and weigh out to make sure everybody's hydrated every day. And if if you're below four to five pounds, you don't practice. I mean, it's it's simple like that. I don't know if there's any one product that's uh, that's great that's going to keep you from cramping if you're not prepared to play on your own. Okay, so what I'm understanding is that proper nutrition and hydration throughout the day, throughout the week, is yes. the re- really the only key that you found. For me, yeah, I, I mean, I, I, we don't have a problem with it. So, and we 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 do nutrition talks with them and uh, kind of coach them along with their diets and what we see them e- eating and things. All right. You guys, anything different? No, I, I wouldn't say anything different. You know, the conditioning is, I think, a bigger aspect. I think uh, there's some new research coming out that may indicate that it's not just hydration based, that it could be a, you know, uh, a muscular problem of exertion and uh, almost at a neurologic level. I don't think they've quite got it figured out what, what's causing it. Um, I know for our guys, obviously, we're in a hot, humid environment and they're losing a lot of fluids. So we do preach the way in, the way out, you know, know how much fluids you've lost. Um, But when it comes down to cramping, I I think for some guys, it's also a conditioning thing. I I tend to see the guys who cramp are the ones that don't play a lot of minutes. And then when they do play, they're overexerting themselves. It may not be that they're dehydrated. Maybe they're just not conditioned for that level of activity. Uh, So obviously, the fitter you are, the less likely you are to cramp because your body isn't reaching that level of I've given everything and, and now my muscles are giving out. Um, so obviously that's the trick for us. I mean, we, we try very hard to make sure our reserve players, who don't play a lot of minutes are working with our fitness coach to do extra runs, to do extra practices, to stay at the same level with our, uh, guys who are out there 90 minutes. It's hard because it's very difficult to replicate game like activities with practice, unless you actually play a scrimmage in practice. Um, but we try our best to keep those guys at the same level. So their conditioning and their fitness is just as high as the guys in the first team who are playing, you know, every Saturday. April and y'all's classes there at U of H, are y'all learning anything about hydration and cramping and those kind of things? I mean, the same thing, proper nutrition and, um, what is it? Proper nutrition and, um, hydration. Hydration. Yeah. (laughs) I don't know. I'm blanking out. Um, is what we're taught as well. Um, I know a lot of athletes like to take Gator Lights and all those type of products before, but I think if they were to work with their hydration and nutrition throughout the week and not just like the day of, then it, they wouldn't have to worry about taking any of those products. Um, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, I would agree. And um, April, um, you know, was able to work with us through the whole season this year for soccer. And she saw firsthand how we educate our athletes. And we have a urine color chart and um, in their bathroom, you know, on the door that they see every day, they're going to the bathroom and they're supposed to know kind of what number, you know, if it's if it's too dark, then, um, you know, I ask them every day what their number is. And when we weigh in, they also have to chart that if it's a seven or a one or a three. And that means, um, you know, they're, they're conscious of, of what their um, urine color looks like every day. And that's kind of a, a good reminder for them to be like, oh, I'm behind. I've only, you know, man, my urine's a little dark today. I'm behind. I better catch up before tomorrow's practice. Um, and, um, you know, I'd like to do the sweat ratio um, testing and stuff, but it's just time consuming to get all that done. But that could really help. Uh, and, you know, to figure out how much sweat each individual is losing is way different. So you might need, um, one person might need, um, you know, um, 20, 28 ounces of water to, um, and Gatorade to replenish for that day when the same person did the same work or a different person did the same workout and needs 48 ounces just because they're a heavier sweater or something like that. Um, but that's, that just is a little more time consuming, but eventually I'd like to get to that. And, um, and also, you know, you have to think about dehydration is it starts, it starts affecting your mental capacity. Um, you know, my, my girls are very, very smart rice girls you know they're very educated and they like to understand and know what else affects your body it's not just you start cramping you know your mental capacity like your mental alertness goes down after um after a bit you know you're not as sharp and you're not as um, alert on the field so you're mentally not thinking as quickly you're not moving to the ball as quickly um so when they start thinking oh it's not just me cramping that's when it that's when it's really really bad oh wait 
I'm not, you know, moving to the ball as quick and they're, they're beating me. Well, that's why it's because you're not getting there. And it's uh, your mental alertness isn't as, uh, you know, as high either. So. All right. So Darren, uh, what are y'all doing? Like, are y'all telling them just water and just Gatorade or April mentioned Gator lights or I've used cramp eggs and, uh, you know, so there's all sorts, there's several different things we've, you know, we try, we give them water, we take Gatorade so that they can have water and Gatorade at the game. We take the Gator lights and cramp eggs and some of them still, we, even with all that stuff or cramping, I know you said it comes down to a muscle or fatigue issue or training issue, which is very likely the case or some of these kids don't sleep well or they work after school after practice or they're playing in a league on the weekend but um is there is there anything that i mean obviously we, we want to try and avoid cokes and sodas and that kind of sure. thing at least that's the current thinking um but is there any of those products that you guys like specifically we we use all those we we, we provide our guys with water we have a league-wide deal with advocare which is a gatorade like product so we mm -hmm. have a sports beverage that we give to our players every day um, we've used the Gator lights in the past, the salts that you mm -hmm. add to the drinks uh, to increase that electrolyte replenishment. I, I try to preach to the guys, not just water. Cause you got, there's a current trend in, uh, you know, <clears throat> athletes, but all humans have tried natural products. So only water or, oh, that's got too much, you know, processed sugar or, but the electrolytes is what's important in the drink, not the sugars. It, you need to make sure that if it's coconut water or if it's, you know, salts put into the water, something other than water to keep that balance up and to help the player. So we've used the, the, the cramp pills. We've used the Gator lights. We've had players who swear by pickle juice. I've heard of the old wives tale of giving them mustard when they start to cramp. I haven't tried that one personally, but I, I've heard of it. Um, there's all kinds of different little tricks out there. I think it does come down to knowing the individual. Uh, we tend to see if a guy's cramp prone usually early in the season because we start up in January, so it's not hot. So if they're cramping at that time, we know it's going to be a problem when it's a lot hotter. And so we try to stay on top of those guys for the way in, the way out, educating them that if they're still having cramp problems, maybe they should try maybe a little bit more of a drink with electrolytes in it. And it, you know, it could be Gatorade, it could be Advocare, it could be you know, any of the various products that are on the market, Powerade something to give them a little bit more of the electrolytes versus just pure water. Um, so um, do I have a favorite? No, I, I just use whatever works for each individual guy. So I've got one guy that likes to take the pills pregame, you know, that you can, you can buy for cramping. Mm -hmm. uh, another guy that swears by gator lights, pours that. I've seen guys pour that into water. That's like drinking seawater. Yeah. But some guys will do it, you know. Um, some guys will just drink Gatorade or the uh, Endurance, which is a higher... Uh, uh, concentration of electrolytes mm -hmm. any of those products that uh, a guy finds that works for him will make sure that they're getting that so that they're avoiding cramps all right don any any different thoughts about the products there um you know we preach too that um during the day when you're eating normal foods um you can salt your food a little extra you can eat um, pretzels bananas are good for potassium even if you're a really really heavy sweater this uh, the sweater, not sweater. Um, they, mm -hmm. you, you can use Lay's potato chips. That one's a, a go-to and I know it's, it's bad for you, but there's so much salt in those things. And so if you know you're going to cramp, maybe just get, um, a little bag of those. If you're a um, heavy sweater, you can really replace a lot of things in there. Um, and you can get your tummy, <laughs> you didn't get that little, uh, junk food craving too. So we just tell them to, uh, lots of extra salt in their foods and, and kind of education on what natural foods to, to eat. All right, Bobby, any, any other thoughts other than what they've said? We have pretty much the same products. I mean, we use the Metalite tabs from time to time and we started a pregame product. It's, uh, it's a, it's a kind of a new one that was out a year or so ago. It's called Exercel. It's uh, an extended release uh, formula. It might be worth looking up, uh, but uh, my guys have seemed to really enjoy it. So that was Exercel? XR Cell. Yeah. XR Cell. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we'll have to look, just look at it and see. <clears throat> yeah. All right. So this is completely random. But did y'all see the, I think it was, I think it was actually Theron that tweeted or retweeted it. There was a video of a guy being carried off the field and he was dropped like four different times. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, yes. I'm pretty sure you guys saw that. So that was an extremely funny video. And, and to me, it's just typical like soccer, like soccer mentality. Um, you know, they carry that little, what is that thing called? The gurney on the field and carry that guy off and drop him three or four times. 
and you know, I don't know if the guy ended up walking away or, or what the problem was, but it's just typical like soccer, at least at, at my level, you know, they're dying, they're dying, they're dying, and then they sure. get up and they're fine. And so, um, <laughs> just just real quick, what is uh, the policy there in the MLS as far as an injury? Uh, sure. Can you go on the field? Can the players come out? That kind of thing. I think it's like most soccer around the world. You have to be called on by the referee. Um, so there, there is embellishment of fouls. I think we all know that. It's mm -hmm. no different than a guy flopping in basketball, taking the charge down the key. Mm -hmm. um, in soccer, it gets a bad reputation. There are some players that use that to their advantage. There, there is only one referee, and they're trying <laughs> to get the fouls called for them. So they'll embellish and, and fake, and sometimes it helps their cause if they stay on the ground and roll around and then the trainer comes out and, and treats them. They're hoping that possibly it'll look more severe and the opponent will get a yellow card, which is an advantage to your team if, right. if somebody possibly gets two and then is you know kicked out of the game. Right, yeah. So it does have that reputation. Um, in terms of injuries, you know, when we're called out, we try to figure out what's going on as quickly as possible. Um, then they've got to obviously come off until the next break in play. Um, but yeah, the, uh, the embellishment of fouls is kind of a, a standard you know, joke for people who want to make fun of soccer. But it does happen in other sports. I mean, we're seeing that in college football where players mm -hmm. are faking injuries, falling down almost dead to slow down, hurry up offenses. I think uh, there's been some cases of that most recently where a player just miraculously falls over. And that's not a timeout, but the defense gets a chance to catch their breath because the other team's going too fast. Um, so it does happen in all sports. Um, I'm, I'm not a fan of it. I'll, I'll be honest with you. I, I, I tend to think of myself as an honest person, and so I don't like embellishment slash lying you know, to make yeah. things look worse than they are, but, uh, it does happen. Um, you know, you, you know, I've, I've worked for coaches before that have said, Hey, make a bigger deal out of it than, than it could be, you know? Um, but then I've got other coaches. I've had coaches that say, don't even get off that bench. He's fine. He'll get up. You know, it just depends on the coach that you're dealing with. And you still have to wait for the ref to call you on anyway. You can't just randomly run on there. It's not like football where there's a stoppage in play and it's okay to run on. So, um, with a continuous clock and the referee in charge, you have to wait till you're called on. So I know in World Cup play, if they're subbed out, they're done. Yes. They're done for the game. Is that the same uh, in your league? Yeah, we follow the same uh, international rules. Bobby's league does the same thing. Uh, college is different. You have the sub rules where they go in and out. Uh, there are three subs allowed. Once you leave, you're not allowed to re-enter that game. Um, so that is uh, pretty much an international rule. Um, there's been talk of trying to change that with all the concussion stuff and, and all of that, but that's you're you're asking to change hundred year old laws of a sport with you know old guys in charge that have been you know in mm -hmm. power forever. So people don't like that kind of change. But uh, yeah, three subs can't go back. No reentry, as we call it. Mm -hmm. um, college is different. I, I don't know the exact rules there, but it is different for subs there. Okay. Yeah, in the college level, um, one in the first half, that player if if they start the game and they come out. Um, they cannot return until the second half. And then there, there's one sub allowed per player um, at the second half as well. So if they start on the bench, they can go in and then come back out um, similar. But, um, yeah, you're talking three subs total for the entire game. And my girls, they can all go in. Um, they just It just depends on which half it is, if they can come back in or go back out or whatever. Um, and so the rule is that similar for us. Um, if there is an injury, it's, a, you know, somebody gets kicked in the shin, it's going to hurt. They're going to roll around a little bit. I don't usually get up and get excited until, you know, one of my, I, I, I have my players go over and ask them, hey, what's wrong? What's hurt? And, you know, and then they say, yes, come on or do not come on. Um, but if they get hit in the head or, or the referee thinks that if it's even close to um, a head injury, they will have us come on no matter what. Um, so that that has been protective for us this year, which is really good. So what happens is we come on, evaluate them. They have to step off the field. And if we if we deem them okay at that point, um, they can go right back on as soon as the ball is in play, then they can step back on the field on their own. So that's a huge impact for us because we're not pressured to say, oh, no, stay on. I'll, t I'll talk to you at halftime because I can't have you back in the game. I can take 10 minutes if I want. The coach is yelling at me. But if I need 10 minutes to evaluate them on the sideline, they, they'll be a man down but they can still go back on if they need to. So that's a that's a huge component that's changed in uh, college soccer the last couple of years. It's a little less pressure on us there. So. All right, so Bobby, if, if a player gets injured and you mm -hmm. go out there, do they have to come off the field? Yes. So if you go they, out, they uh, have to come off? Yeah, they, they have to leave until the next uh, – until the referee essentially waves them back on. So they'll, they'll make sure that uh, they won't be entering the field and then it, it – an advantage position they'll they'll wait till 
the most opportune time to get them back on. But uh, yeah, it's we we play a man down anytime I'm evaling somebody on the side. Uh, the only difference between my league and Theron's is we actually get five subs. Gotcha. So if I go on the field, the player comes off, but they immediately sub. So you know, at the high school right. level, anytime I go on the field, they have to come off no matter what it is. And so, but you still play full strength. Yeah, but they, then they just sub out unless unless that player got a card, which you know is universal. They come, they have to come out, kind of thing. Right. Well, I, th- I think I don't know if we get a yellow card, that player has to be subbed out. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Uh, and a red card, obviously, um, they're out. So yeah. But so the, with the yellow, with they get a yellow card, they have to be subbed out, and then they can come back in. Um, but anyways, it's it has nothing to do with injuries. Just wondering the. Uh, <laughs> The logistics of how you guys have to work that. So, all right. We try not to drop them from the stretcher, but it happens. <laughs> <laughs> I really watched that thing like five or ten times, and if I can find it, I'll send it back out again. But it's it's hilarious. Um, There's a few of them. Yeah. Maybe I'll have to search it up. You have any uh, keywords there for me to search? Uh, soccer player dropped by stretcher. <laughs> you'll, you'll find a bunch of them. All right. Okay. Um, just before my kids are about to leave, you guys have any other questions before I, I continue the conversations? Anybody? Anybody have any other questions? Oh, some of these they made. No? All right. Okay, so give me one second. All right. See you guys. All right. So, Thanks, guys. Bye, guys. Thanks for having us. All right, so I know the camera is on me right now. I'm wearing my Houston Dynamo shirt that Darren just gave me today. Very cool looking. I'm very stylish. <laughs> all right. So I'm not sure what all you can see on the camera there, but I just showed off the new shirt that I got and just put on. So very cool. Thanks. And no problem. I don't know. Did you did you get one of these? Did you build one? I did. I did. <laughs> yeah. Somebody pointed that out to me at the uh, gift shop. So I was like, how cool. I've actually... Uh, We've got a little trainer cart. The ironic thing is I don't actually have a cart. <laughs> in my work, so. hey, poser. That's the closest thing that I have is that little uh, Oyo Sports uh, plastic cart. That'll work, though. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to later, I'm going to get you to, to sign the box there, and then okay. I'll be able to hang it up, put it up here in the, in the classroom. But uh, what I wanted to talk about is specific. Um, let's go with this. We'll start with ankle, then we'll go hamstring, groin, and then concussion. So your, your favorite exercises uh, for sport specific rehab, because today I was working with a volleyball player and we were doing some of the, where you stand behind them and, and toss the ball and they catch it. And it's like a negative. Uh, so you have to slow it down and then throw it back because she has some bicep tendonitis. So we're just working through anything that we can. She plans to go play in college. And, and so what are some of the things that specifically you would do uh, to return a soccer player with an ankle injury. We've already talked about making sure they're conditioned as far as riding the bike. Um, but what are some exercises that I might not think of here? Uh, I'll start with Aaron. I mean, for me, you know, favorite exercises, I love using the BOSU ball um, because it is so difficult, challenging for their uh, um, balance and their strength. You know, uh, it is also, it's coordination thing. You put them up there and it's, it's suddenly an unstable surface. Uh, we'll, we'll often put them on the ball in a single leg stance and have them kick with the other leg. It's, it's a very functional exercise because depending on the ankle, whether the injured ankle is their dominant foot or their plant foot, you can switch it up because in our sport, their ankle isn't just for planting, cutting and running. It is a weapon of choice. You know, they have to be able to strike a ball. So that adds another dimension. So I love putting them on the BOSU ball, toss the ball to them, have them kick it back to you. It makes them do everything. They've got to balance themselves. They've got to have the strength to stay up there. They're they're in single leg stance. <clears throat> they've got to focus on the the ball, and they've got to knock it back to your hands. Well, hopefully back to your hands so they don't ruin the training <laughs> room. But um, it's a great exercise, and it, and it works everything in the lower extremity. Yeah, um, I really like sport specific um, like return to play drills. That's probably my favorite part of uh, of any kind of rehab. So we're out on the field. They're not quite ready to get back into contact drills yet. Um, so we'll do a box drill with cones out on the field on the grass. They're in their cleats. Um, you know, you know, you do four cones, um, and we have them, um, you know, sprint up karaoke to the side, backpedal, and then um, shuffle. But when I'm doing that, um, as April saw this year when she was with me, we add a ball to everything we can. And so at the 
beginning, they'll do 10 toe touches on the ball to get their heart rate up. And then um, they're sprinting up to me and they're going to pass a ball to me, uh, pass a ball and return it back. And then they'll, um, then they'll go karaoke, backpedal, and then shuffle, and then do it again. And so um, you can have them pass the ball, you can have them head the ball to you, um, you know, take it off their thigh, um, one touch, two touch, all these different skills that may maybe they haven't done in the last um, month because they've been out with this ankle injury. It's getting them just back into it, getting their confidence back up, getting their touch back, uh, stuff like that. It's a lot of it's a lot of fun. I'm not very good at soccer, so I've I've uh, improved a lot. I'd like to say in the last couple of years, but um, sometimes I have the the old manager help me with that one. But it's all right, you're, you're improving. You're improving. I am improving. Okay. Right I now, you're a little bit more off that. balance. You just gotta so. Yeah, the, I kind of got to perfect the five yard rehab pass. I call it. As yeah. long as you can hit a ball square to one five yards away, you're good. Exactly. Without killing your toe. Yep. That, you're that's good. my range. I like to say <laughs> any, any yep. farther than that, and we're in trouble. Yep. Get a get a manager. Or, yep. Somebody. <laughs> all right, Bobby. They, they they took the good ones. I mean, those, the, <laughs> we all do the same stuff. I mean, yeah. Bosu ball volleys. We do tons of those. Um, I'll add in, you know, with the box drills and things, instead of just running a, a, a set pattern, um, switching directions on my call, uh, turning your back and, uh, and, you know, turning, receiving the ball. And obviously it's like, you know, I, I don't play pro soccer anymore or anymore at all. <laughs> um, so my pass is not going to be extremely accurate every time. And I mean, I'll drive a ball at them and, uh, you know, they have to react to it. I mean, and that's, that's part of it. And you know, the ball's not going to be right at your feet every, every time. So, you know, the, the, the changing directions on my command, uh, receiving my bad passes, things like that, they all help. All right. So favorite exercises for ankle, BOSU ball for Theron, any, any type of drill you can do, including the ball, whether it's uh, dribbling or heading for Don and then, uh, Kind of the same thing, but also reacting reacting off of uh, your less than professional soccer skills for Bobby. <laughs> That's right. All right, that'll work. That'll work. All right. So, what about least favorite ankle things, Bobby? We'll start with you since you kind of got the uh, the last pick on that. So, least favorite things that people do for ankle rehab uh, or least uh, specific to soccer, maybe. Hmm. That's another good one. Um... Least favorite. I mean, I guess right when they're fresh and you're just kind of in the boring range of motion part of it, just, you know, rolling on that, on the, on the, I'll, I'll use the BOSU ball again and just have them put the, put the ball side down and rolling on the top of it for range of motion uh, in the whirlpool, things like that. Um, I think just the standard stuff, like, uh, like he's saying with range of motion, the ABCs, I kind of try to make it fun and tell them, you know, today, okay, you're going to go in the cold tub and, and spell out, I love Dawn, um, instead of the ABCs and they laugh at that one, get a good, good rouse out of them. So, um, anytime you can change it up a little bit, but that's kind of the standard stuff, um, stretching, you know, the Achilles tendon, you still got to stretch all of that, uh, the whole complex out of the ankle. So just the, I, I would agree the first, you know, 10 days or so when you're working on, swelling, edema control, um, you know, pain control, stuff like that. It's, it's pretty much just the same stuff every day that you're kind of working with. It, it's not very fun. I'd have to say my least favorite is probably the marble pickups. Oh, there you go. They're just, they're boring. <laughs> they're monotonous. Players hate doing them. I mean, it works the intrinsic muscles of the foot, but it's just, it, it's not fun. You know, every athlete wants to be an athlete and sitting there picking up marbles with their feet. You, most of them, you say it to them, the, the first look on their face is like, what? Yeah. What did you just say? Like, they that's can't believe one. that you actually want them to do that. So, yeah, that's probably my least favorite exercise. It's an important foundational exercise for the intrinsic muscles of their foot, but it's by no means fun. It's probably their least favorite as well. All right, so do you have a, another solution for the marble pickups? You know, they, they make that little toe scruncher or, or towel gathering they're all the same. It's, it's a fairly boring, monotonous exercise, but you try to convince them that it's an important part because if they don't have that strength, then how are they going to get to the point where they're reacting and doing the higher level stuff? It, it's usually the early on stuff when progress is slow. It may be their least favorite more so than mine. I know they need to do it and I know the reasons why and I try to convey that to them, but it's usually their least favorite is anything that's like simple and boring and not even close to being soccer. You know, gotcha. April, you have any other thoughts there? Um, yeah, ankle theraband because I'm an expert in that now. <laughs> but, <laughs> but they probably don't like that as well because you're just sitting there doing that for a few days. 
or months. Yeah. I make mine do it for months. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if they get ankle tape, they get to have TheraBand exercises. Yeah. Yes, yes. I'm right there with yep. you. If if you're getting taped, it's because you're doing treatment. So. That's right. <laughs> for us. So so while we're right there, Darren, do you tape any guys? Yeah. How many? Uh, it depends on the year. Um, some years I can tape as many as like seven, eight guys on the on the roster. Sometimes it's as low as one or two. Uh, some guys do it pure superstition. They've got no problems. You got other guys that, um, you know, I, I call it the tape sock. It's just stretch tape and it basically covers their foot a couple times. And everybody's different. I don't think I do two tape jobs the same on our team. Um, everybody's got their individual, you know, requests of what they want and how they like to get taped. Um, but at, at our level, sometimes you, yes, I would love for them to do TheraBand exercise every single day, but. I also know that they're running around and their ankle is fine and there's not problems. Um, I'll, I'll say on them to rehab, you know, as they're coming back from an injury, but preventative wise, most of our guys are pretty strong and they're just doing it more out of tradition or superstition. Like we were talking about earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, some guys do it just to simply avoid getting blisters on their heels because their shoes are so tight, you know? So, um, yeah, it's, it's, I'd say, 25% of the ankles I tape are actually functionally being supported. The others are, more just a nice little tape sock to prevent blisters and tradition. All right, Bobby, about the same for you? Exactly the same. I'm, I mean, I may have one to two players a season that I tape functionally. The rest are just, you know, whatever they want, wraps, covers. I mean, I've had a few just, you know, it's all just stretch tape with a couple of heel and waist pads underneath, and they're good to go. I got a couple guys this year that tape themselves. They mm -hmm. just grab the pre-wrap and wrap it around their feet. Again, this is probably a cultural thing. They've not either had an athletic trainer or a physiotherapist where they come from. A um, lot, lot of, you know, smaller countries, all they have is a massage guy that just, you know, rubs out their legs after a game, and that's that's healthcare to them. So I have guys that will just come in and grab their uh, grab the pre-wrap, grab the stretch tape, and do it themselves. And if that's what they're comfortable with, that's okay. You know, uh, I try to find out if they have any problems, anything that we can help. But at the same time, you know, I, it's, it's worked for them up to this point. It's gotten them to this point. It's not doing any harm. You know, I don't see him taping himself into, you know, inversion. He's going to be in trouble, yeah. you know. So I, I, I look at it as, you know, what it's tradition. That's just what they're going to do. All right. So Alexandra Blennis in the chat room. So what about recurring ankle injuries? Are they are they common? So what's your approach, approach, especially at the highest level of soccer, with the demand to get them on the field as fast as possible? So... Well, reoccurring injuries, I mean, it tells you that there's something wrong. They either have a, you know, a structural issue. You know, there are guys that the more you sprain your ankle, the looser it is, and it's just going to roll a lot easier. Those are the guys you just have to stay on top of to, to constantly rehab their ankles. I, I've got a player who has had some ankle injuries in the past, and he's very diligent about doing his exercises every day. And he knows that if he doesn't do his exercises every day, he's going to have trouble. So... Uh, you just have to keep working on those guys. Make sure that there's not anything structurally wrong that can be addressed in the off season, you know, through like an ankle reconstruction or, you know, if it's an issue with, you know, a partially torn tendon. Uh, once you know that they're structurally, you know, put together, some of it's just strength and taking care of uh, staying strong. Um, because we all know the athlete who rehabs, they get healthy, then they stop doing their strength work, and then now they're having a problem again. So uh, a lot of it is staying on top of strength. Um, I don't think there's, this is going to sound weird, but I don't think there's any injury that being stronger is a bad thing and that it doesn't help, you know? All right, Don, any different thoughts? Yeah, um, definitely. I think we focus on, you know, the chronic ankle sprains in the weight room more than uh, in the training room where, you know, they are doing those um, extra weight exercises. They'll do um, a single leg uh, RDL instead of a double leg. That way they're always constantly working on their balance and, and their proprioceptive, uh, you know, control and uh i think that helps a lot so they're they're constantly doing those kind of say, uh, kinds of things calf raises um in the weight room where i don't have to necessarily focus on it as much as the strength coach does and um, i'm blessed to have that opportunity where we can separate it but we're also working together saying hey she's a little weaker on this side can you you know add a couple more reps or do this to her um you know add this exercise in at the end of the um weight session or something like that too um, and the, you know, the other struggle with soccer players is their shoes are so tight that they don't want ankle braces, No, you know? So, I mean, you're never either, used to brace. yeah, I mean, they, they will, they will never use an ankle brace hardly ever. And so if, if it is a chronic ankle sprain and you're taping them, uh, you know, if, if they want that and they agree to it, 
I have two games in, in, I have a Friday game and a Sunday afternoon game. So I don't have time and, and our season is three months max. Um, you know, I don't have a lot of time if I have an ankle sprain to get them back. A lot of times that's a season ending injury for me, unfortunately. So we have to make sure and prevent as much as possible. And so I had three chronic ankle sprains this year from last year's injuries. And we taped all three of those ankles just to make sure that they had a little bit more support. Um, but it's also frustrating because it's an outdoor sport. So in Houston and um, by halftime, their ankles practically, you know, the ankle tape job is practically broken down anyways, but at least they have something on there um, to maybe give them a little more mental support, um, you know, after that. All right, Bobby, you have any different thoughts on chronic ankle sprains? Not really. Those two, uh, they, they kind of nailed it. I mean, with, with, at, the, at the top level, I don't, I don't know how Theron's team is structured, but ours is structured on the bonus program and players will rehab. They'll try and do the, the best rehab or get themselves physically ready to be out there because if they're not out there, they're, they're uh, risking losing money. So at the top level, they, uh, they want to be out there and they want to they be out there and stay out there. All right, so we're going to move up the chain just a little bit. We talked about ankle injuries. We're going to go to hamstrings. Bobby, since I've already got the camera on you, why don't you start us off favorite um, and then favorite hamstring exercises for soccer and then the, let's go with the least effective that you've seen for soccer. Least effective. I, I don't know if I would, I don't know if I would call one ineffective. I think that I, I don't think there's any one that, that works better than the others. I, we, we, we tend to use a whole program. That, that, that incorporates the RDLs and the hamstring curls on the Swiss balls and, you know, the, the flexibility, the bands, the, it's, it, it, for us, it, it's a, it's a group of exercises. We don't rely on any one specific thing to get done. I and mean, we have a, a sheet that we print out for them. That's our, we can, we call it our hamstring program. And it's, uh, I mean, it's, it's got a little bit of everything, a little bit of band work, a little bit of, you know, body weight strengthening a little bit of uh, the, the RDLs with uh, dumbbells, uh, ball curls, and then uh, three-way ha hamstring flexibility stretches. You know, you stretch into through pure formers. We, we stretch. We try and get everything. All right, so is any one of those any – what's your favorite way to incorporate that um, hamstring rehab into soccer – or soccer into the hamstring rehab? We, we basically make that uh, part of their warm-up. If, if it's if it's a player we've identified that is has got an issue, then they they come in early, and all of our players are in early before training anyway, working out in the gym as part of their warm up. So this player would have to just incorporate that program as part of any other uh, individual warm up they would want to do. So that just becomes part of their daily routine. All right, Don. Um, I think with women's sports, it's a it's a big difference where you have to focus on hamstring strength for women and make sure that they are very, very, very strong. Um, you know, we're very quad dominant. And so to prevent ACLs, to prevent hamstring strains, everything like that, you have to make sure the hamstrings are, are very strong. So once again, in the weight room, we, we established that. Um, I, I think um, during the rehab process, again, probably my favorite is towards the end when you can work with the, you know, hamstrings of fast twitch muscle. You've got to have that explosive explosiveness coming off the um off the start or anything like that so we do a lot of um cutting and moving and turning direction but also uh you know that explosiveness um i like i the least favorite i you know i think probably just the general hamstring curl on a machine probably is the the most boring of them all i think using a plyo ball where you can get a lot more proprioceptive movement in um, and using your entire body making them sweat with that makes them feel like they're getting a lot more done and they are getting more done than just sitting on a um you know a, a biodex machine or something where they're just using their hamstring uh hamstring curl i, I think best exercise is probably anything in, on the uh, eccentric so some yeah. people call them russian mm -hmm. some people call them nordics Bobby alluded to him calling them falls or, you know, where the partner is holding your heels and they're mm -hmm. falling forward. Yeah. Uh, the high level of recruitment that that exercise, you know, uh, requires uh, makes it one that is good for the hamstring. Um, some people will argue that it, it doesn't do what it's supposed to, but studies show like if you do a uh, preventative program like the, the FIFA 11 plus, which is a, a set of 11 plus warm up drills, which includes those Nordics that lower extremity injuries decrease, um, specifically knee and hamstring injuries. Um, 
for me, if we're talking about least favorite, I think just static stretching. I think athletes still have it in their mind that they need a static stretch during warmups or prior to going out to play. And most studies show that static stretching isn't what you want to do prior to an activity. It, we'll use it in rehab if there's some tension there and we think we can overcome that. But um, it's still, I mean, you watch a lot of warmups around the world, whether it's the NFL or if it's the NBA or, or whatever, and they're doing static stretching and they're just about to go run and jump and sprint. So um, it's probably my least favorite just because I don't think it does as much pre-game or pre-practice as mm -hmm. people think it should. I think they should save that for after if they've got specific issues. But prior to that, they should be using their hamstrings as part of their warm-up, like Bobby was alluding to. Find those guys that have those problems, incorporate it into their warm-up, and it'll make them you know, perform better. All right, so continuing up the line, you see a lot of reaching injuries because they're reaching, you know, they're groin injuries because they're reaching out to, you know, make a move or to block the ball or whatever. So, uh, Theron, we'll start with you. Um, best way to rehab or to deal with groin injuries, in your opinion? Well, I, I think a lot of what we see with our groin guys is, is a, again, a lack of strength in that area. It's not a commonly strengthened uh, muscle. You know, you go to a weight room and everybody's looking at the mirror or they're looking at their partner and they're doing everything in this plane straight ahead. So, you know, soccer players already have huge quads. They already overwork their hip flexors. So they've got this anterior dominance and they're ignoring their, their adductors and they're ignoring their glutes. So we'll see a, an imbalance between those. So we really push a lot of glute strengthening as well as adductor strengthening once they get injured to try and get them back on the field. Um, there are two types of groin injuries there. Like you alluded to the, the stretch injury where they're reaching for a ball. And then there's also the one where they're activating it, where I see a guy tries to whip a ball across, or he really tries to forcefully shoot. Those are slightly different in terms of, you know, how they feel and how long they take. Um, so you just, you try and balance out the muscles of the hips when they, they get injured. Um, a lot of our guys still tend to have some glute weakness. Cause again, it's not a popular exercise. Um, and, we try and make sure they're as strong as possible when they come back so that we can have them not re-injure themselves because re-injury is definitely a problem. Yep. Um, I would, I would agree um, with the glute uh, strengthening and stretching. Um, we do a lot of uh, band walks um, where you have the band around your ankles and they're doing kind of a shuffle or a walk and a monster walk um, and clams too, where they're sitting on a table and they're, you know, coming in and out and working those um, adductors and abductor muscles and everything like that. So I would, I would agree that the whole complex is very, very important. And, um, you know, a lot of times I'll see more groin and hamstring strains in the beginning of my season where there's a lot of muscle fatigue sitting in. So um, a muscle has started to overcompensate one shut down, which is, um, you know, the hip flexor or something like that. So the groin will have to kind of kick in a little bit more and they'll have that overuse, uh, overuse or overcompensating muscle and it'll finally give out, give out as well. So once we get through the, if they come back in shape and, and we're doing well with two a days or preseason, um, usually if we make it past that first month or so, then we we're fortunate to not have as, as many overuse at least. Um, we still will have the striking injuries like um, they're in a saying, but I think fitness is a big part of that with uh, the fatigue. All right. So uh, a lot of the things that we've been using now, we've been using a lot of foam roller uh, do you guys, I know you always see JJ Watt, if you're watching the NFL, he carries one out to the field to warm ups or whatever. Uh, how do you guys, do you use that in, at all in soccer, Darren? Use it all the time. We, uh, we buy one of the big long foam rollers, cut it into thirds. Every one of our players has one. Um, so they have one in their locker. There's no excuse why they can't be <clears throat> rolling on that in the locker room when they come in, if they've got something that's sore, we have charts up on the wall that show them how to roll all the different parts of their body. So if they have any questions, they can either ask us or see that on the wall. Uh, we also incorporate that on, on game day. We do a uh, team activation. Our fitness coach will take the guys into uh, a room at the hotel while we're on the road and have them go through a foam rolling series. So we actually take 18 foam rollers with us on the road. It's, it's the biggest lightweight bag you've ever seen because it weighs <laughs> about two pounds and it's like big enough for, you know, a huge duffel. So uh, the guys will roll. They'll, they'll roll everything in their lower extremities, hamstrings, quads, calves. Uh, groins, glutes, just to get everything loosened up. So that, that self myofascial release is very important. And uh, studies show that it's great for keeping the tissue nice and soft and pliable um, and which can prevent injuries. You know, that to me is better than static stretching. So we, we definitely use, we have foam rollers everywhere, training room, in the locker room, stadium, wherever we're at, there's some around. Don? 
um, yeah, very similar to that. We do, we do, uh, we use the lacrosse ball as well. Mm. Um, something where you can pinpoint a little bit. Oh, it hurts so good though. It's, <laughs> it's one of those good pains, um, where you can isolate something a little bit, um, you know, in a smaller area. And, um, before every strength, uh, workout for every, every weightlifting workout, we do the, uh, roll out, roll out before and after. And then, um, we don't do it quite every practice, but we try to at least uh, incorporate it two, three times a week, uh, and go from there. Bobby. Uh, yeah, we do the same thing. Uh, I don't carry 18 of them on the road. I carry one and, and let those guys do it. But we also have the, uh, the little smaller uh, sticks that, uh, that have the handles and the rollers that they can uh, roll out, uh, you know, quads and, and calves and things like that. So a few, a few guys like the little individual stick as opposed to the big foam rollers. But, yeah, we use, we use a ton of, uh, of rolling exercises. So you guys have found that the best practice for foam rolling is, is using it almost every day. Yeah. I mean, to me, to me, it's, it's just like, you know, the old recommendation of stretch every day. I mean, I, I think it's a better uh, modality for getting guys to, to get their tissue loose and soft because you run around, you get tight, you get sore, you get stiff. It happens, you know, to counteract that, get on the foam roller and guys hate it because it hurts, you know, but the more you do it, the better off you are. You know, so what I'll see is we, we used to have the, the white foam rollers that were soft. None of our guys want to use those anymore because it's not strong enough. Mm -hmm. So they, they want to use the ones that are a little bit more firm. And we have all the other things, the lacrosse ball or a softball or a baseball. We'll, we'll even use the core of a uh, flexi wrap mm -hmm. as a roller for the bottom of their foot or anything smaller that they want to, you know, sit and put pressure on. Um, so any of those tools that you can use, and it doesn't have to be a $50 you know, foam roll that's got fancy logo on it. It can be a piece of PVC pipe if they can tolerate that, you know. Um, usually once they get used to foam rolling, they, they want it to be a little bit more firm so it actually pushes back on them. But uh, we use that stuff as much as possible. Uh, I incorporate it into rehab as, as part of, you know, the warm-up, you know, or getting started each day. And then we try to use it with our guys, like I said, every, uh, every game they're in the locker room. We take them on the hotel, on the road, so we have them. So, yeah. Use them all the time. All right. So next up on my list is concussions. So, um, Bobby, we'll start with you. Mm -hmm. What What are some of the ways that you guys, the best ways that you guys uh, manage, deal with, return them to play with concussions? Um, we, we've, we've done the, the computer testing, you know, baseline testing in the past. Uh, we, we used Axon. Um, you know, really, we, we just you know, we'll we'll pre-test them, send them out to play, and then you just basically have to wait till one happens. There's no magic to it. So when one does happen, it's you know we do scat three forms and things like that for repeated tests. We do the repeated uh, computer testing, and then we just have our general return to play protocol that we use, which is you know the, the graduated steps through. You know, once you're completely symptom free at rest, then we start to get you moving and as each day goes by if, if you're able to progress to the next level then we'll we'll bring you all the way up and eventually return to play if we can and at any point during the steps you just go back to square one all right don then you guys have anything anything different um i mean obviously you know we have our our return to play protocols that we that we follow um, and he talked about the computerized testing, but any, anything that, that you feel is more specific to soccer? Um, well, specific to soccer is a little, a little di more difficult, but as an NCAA rule, we're required to speak with the coaches and the athletes every year and have them sign a, um, sign a piece of paper saying, I understand the risks of concussions, um, what this can do to me, stuff like that. And so I think education is a really important part of this and, and to have the athletes know not to take it lightly and, and to treat it very seriously and mature. Um, I, I go one step further usually every year and I find a video um, of an of a unfortunate or sad case where there's a, a football player, or sometimes it's harder to find soccer, but um, of an athlete that has had too many concussions and they, they didn't report their concussion and they went in again and got hit and you know now they have brain damage and the, it's hard for them to walk and talk and and once you see something like that and it and it it hits home with you and they're like holy cow you know it, usually the the room's pretty quiet afterwards but i think that um unfortunately with that situation you need to learn from somebody else's um 
you know, mishap there or un, um, accident and don't take it for granted that it wouldn't happen to you. And I think that after that, they respect the concussion protocol and um, telling us, hey, I'm not sure if I have a concussion or not, but will you check me out? I'd rather them come to me any day with a I'm not sure question than, um, you know, staying in too long and stuff like that. So I think they, they respect it a little bit more after. Anything different? Not anything different. I think we do all the things that Bobby talked about yeah. with, from uh, preseason baseline testing. We do the same type of education. We actually have a video that we make our guys sit down and coaches watch, mm -hmm. uh, sign off saying, yeah, I watch this. I understand. Uh, we have them do uh, a survey of their attitudes towards concussion and what they knew before and after the video. Because there are some guys, it's the first time they've seen it and they're learning new things about, oh, I didn't realize that that was a sign of concussion. I've had that before. So uh, we do all that. We do our baseline testing. When a player is injured and removed from the game, obviously we only have three subs. You know, this is one of the controversies at the highest level of soccer is you only have three subs. What if you've done all those subs and then somebody gets a concussion? Well, you play a man down. You know, that's that's how it works. Right. Um, there is some talk of changing those rules. That's going to be a, a long process. I would love to see it, but that's a, another three-hour long podcast, I'm sure. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> uh, again, when they get injured, we make sure that they're examined uh, by myself, by our team physician, who is uh, a concussion expert. Uh, we then refer them also to neuropsychological testing uh, at the hospital. Our partner, uh, Houston Methodist, takes care of us on that aspect. Um, they have to pass that examination. They have to pass more computerized baseline testing after they've proven that they have no symptoms. So like Bobby talked about, we check them every day from concussion till I have no symptoms. Then we refer them for more testing make sure they pass that testing. Then we begin a drawn out process of graduated increased levels of activity. Once that's all okay, then we turn to the physician and say, he's not reporting any problems. He's passed all of his tests. Is he clear to play? And the physician says, yes, he may return to practice. So. All right, Bobby, I got a question for you from Rachel from the chat room. Uh, what's your take on Axon? So she's looking at incorporating it into the school that she's at now. So uh, go ahead and give your summary of Axon. I think it's been I think it's been good. Um, as far as using a lot of the the retesting, I mean, computer baseline testing is is it is what it is. It, it's a tool. I don't I won't say if it's a good tool or a bad tool. It's just another you know tool in the box. Um, I would never uh, I would never put aside. Um, a good clinical judgment for a computer test. Um, but I, I would, if you're considering adding, if you have the, the means to add it, I would say, you know, go for it. I, I think it's a good program. Um, but, but at the end of the day, I mean, clinical judgment, you, you can't, you can't beat that. All right. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, and then there was another question. So it says handling treatments while traveling, you know, Theron, you already talked about, you have to go to a, a different room. Uh, does your, does your uh, bedroom or your hotel room typically become a portable athletic training room? People come in there for treatment or. Yeah, we, we do. Uh, we do a number of treatments on the road. Depends on the setup. Uh, we usually have one room that's dedicated for, for treatment. We drag all of our stuff in there. Uh, usually the home team is kind enough to provide us a portable treatment table at the hotel uh, so we don't have to travel. We, we do bring an extra one for myself and my assistant so we both have a, t a table to treat off of. And then we have a room that we live in usually right next door. Uh, or sometimes we have a hotel suite where there's a front room. Uh, and then obviously if we're on the road for <clears throat> like preseason, we can be living out of a hotel for a week. So we try to make sure that we have enough space in a, uh, <clears throat> a suite or a ballroom to work out of so the guys can come and, and be professional do what they need to prior to going to the training site. Um, but yeah, we treat our guys on the road. Um, typically we leave on a Friday uh, after practice. So we'll do treatments Friday night. We'll do treatments Saturday in the morning. Um, and then uh, Saturday night after the game, if anything's needed before we head back out Sunday. So yeah, I do, I do work uh, on the road out of the hotel. It's not a, Oh, once we're on the road, I'm on vacation. You know, Everybody mm -hmm. asked me, oh, how was the city? What'd you see? I'm like, I saw a hotel. I saw the stadium. <laughs> I saw the airport. Yep, you know, that's about it. If I'm lucky, I get a couple hours on, on Saturday afternoon while the, the boys are napping pregame for a quick little tour around whatever I can walk to. Yeah. All right, Don, any 
Um, well, I'm kind of jealous of the extra room, that's for sure. So um, when we're, same thing, we do treatments all the time on the road. Um, we're gone four days at a time, mm -hmm. usually Thursday through Sunday, and we play mm -hmm. on a Friday and a Sunday and then come home Sunday after the game. So um, if we need to, we'll uh, we'll we'll leave bef or after class. So we'll get a treatment in at the training room um, at Rice before we leave on Thursday morning. I'll make him get up, ask them to get up early. <laughs> I mean, make um, and uh, get up early and, and do a treatment. And then the same thing on the road, but it's in my hotel room on my bed. Or, you know, if we do have a suite where there's, uh, you know, the the couch and stuff in the front, then we'll pull out the table and the maid's probably wondering what the heck we're doing. But to destroy a hotel room. Maids yep, hate me. Yep, yep. Yep. So we'll take a small stem unit um, a lot of times and uh, definitely a Normatec. That's one of my go to's on the road. Um, and a couple of uh, smaller units if we have um, some handheld, you know, complex machine or something like that. But I try to travel light, but you also, it depends on how many injuries we have at the time too, um, uh, depending on what we take. The, for the conference tournament a couple weeks ago, we took a, an electrical stem machine, a complex unit, um, which is a little handheld, a Normatec, and, um, and a bunch of foam rollers, stuff like that. So we, we took it a, a lot more things because we were planning on being there for a longer time than we were. But um, <laughs> But yeah, it's uh, it's in my hotel room, and a lot of times that's frustrating because I feel like they're just in and out the whole day. But we just make appointments, and they come in and say, "Okay, you're at one, you're at one twenty, you're at one thirty, and ready, set, go." That's it. Ice tub or ice baths in the uh, bathtubs. Yep. They make their own. <laughs> All right. Um, uh, there was a question about PRI, Postural Restoration uh, Institute. So that's one of the things they talk about the breathing patterns and core stability and, uh, hamstring strains. Have you dealt with that any, uh, we'll start with Aaron. I had an introductory course, uh, for PRI a year or two ago. Um, it's not something that I follow. Um, I, I thought the techniques were interesting, but it's not something I've incorporated into my programs. Um, there are a number of athletic trainers in our league. I, I know one team specifically that's very into it. Um, but personally, that's not something that I put into my repertoire. I mean, again, everybody's got their philosophies. You know, some people are very FMS uh, or SFMA based. Some people are PRI. You know, everybody's kind of got their twist on how they do things. Um, but PRI is not something that I use on a regular basis. All right, Don, any experience with it? Um, not really. I don't, we don't incorporate it too much on the athletic training side. I know our strength coaches um, is looking into that, and he started doing a little bit of that um, this last semester when they were warming up some um, on our slow days. But, uh, yeah, I don't have much experience with that. Bobby, you got any experience with uh, breathing patterns? No, not really. We haven't, uh, we haven't used that. All right. Well, fair enough. That's an easy enough question. All right. Um, now, any any – like parting tips for dealing with um, dislocations or, or breaks on the field? Because, I mean, obviously there's a lot of people watching you, whereas I might have, you know, 50 people in the stands. You might have thousands or something and TV. So, Bobby, got any parting tips for dealing with an injury on the field? Um, try not to freak out. <laughs> I've seen that happen before. Um, you just – you kind of you, – you have to – you have to be the calming factor uh, for the athlete as well, because I mean, if they look down and see their ankle pointing the wrong way, they're gonna they're gonna lose it. So, you know, part of it is you know, take care of of uh, what you've got on the field and uh, take care of their them mentally as well. But uh, you got to be prepared for everything, and you can't uh, you can't lose it on the field. You got to be uh, you got to be calm and cool, sitting on the bench and calm and cool with a tib fib in your hand. It's 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 all it's all the same thing. Um, you know, basically, uh, demeanor is key. I mean, you gotta, you gotta be, uh, you gotta be smooth out there. All right, Don. Um, I just think the bond between you and your athletes, you know, I'm, I'm very fortunate to have 26, 27, uh, kids, um, of my own, uh, with the soccer team and, and they trust me and they know me and I know their personalities really well. So if I can have that calming effect when, you know, something does happen and, you know, just take their hand or, or, you know, if they're freaking out, just take their hand or, or hold their arm and just say, you're going to be okay. Let me do this, you know, and, um, you know, have them take a deep breath with you. A lot of times that calms you down. It calms the athlete down. Everyone's kind of more in control. Um, you know, stuff like that 
I think it's just, it helps when you, when you're so close to the athletes and you know, their personality really well, it might be a little harder for somebody at a high school level where, um, you know, you know, the athletes, but they're, they're definitely not with, you're not with them 24 hours a day. I travel, I, you know, weights, conditioning, everything. I'm with those kids all the time. Unlike, um, your 2000 or however many athletes you have. Oh my gosh. I right. can't even. So that would be a little harder, but they gain their trust for sure. I think, you know, you guys hit it on the head. It, it's remaining calm. And I think the biggest way to remain calm is you know what to do. You've rehearsed, you've practiced, you have an emergency action plan. You may not have an ambulance on the sideline. You may not have a doctor with you, but you know where your splint bag is. You know that you're going to need to call 911. You know, you're going to, you know, you've got this all planned out and rehearsed. So for you, you're just going through the steps, you know, um, it's important that you have that all laid out ahead of time. You can't wait till somebody breaks a leg and then you figure out, oh, I should have probably brought my cell phone out with me. You know, I worked at a high school before and I, I, I had, you know, really crummy, you know, not even vacuum splints. They were like the blow up air splints, but mm -hmm. I had to learn how to use them because that's what I had. I had a cell phone, so I knew I was calling 911, but I needed to, to have a plan in place of who was I calling after that to, to let the ambulance through that gate and how do they get here? Um, and then it, it gives you the confidence to remain calm, to handle the situation. And then the athlete knows, Hey, this person's in charge. They've got it dialed in. They're not panicking. They're not trying to figure it out. They're not going, Oh, where did I leave that? Uh, what do I do? Cause you know, I was an athletic trainer by myself at a high school before and, and you are by yourself and you've got to have it all figured out. Right. And so if you plan ahead and you have it all laid out and you rehearse it, you know what you're doing, you're going to be calm, collected and handle the situation just fine. All right, April, any uh, final questions? I did have a question. So I've been seeing the concussion headbands being worn lately. What are y'all's thoughts on them prevention or are they, do you think they actually prevent the con concussion? I don't know if the studies show that they prevent concussions. For me, a, a headband, and I've, I've had players wear the – the rugby caps or the you know the soccer specific headbands i think at my level the the clash of heads it's it's a pretty <clears throat> aggressive thing guys are going up they're leading with an elbow mm -hmm. to, to keep separation from the guy it's usually the clash of heads together or the elbow that causes some kind of cut to the forehead and i think those protective devices work great for that mm -hmm. you're going to see less split you know eyebrows or or eyelids um the, the issue for me is you're still hitting those heads together and the brain's still moving inside. So yeah, I'm, I'm sure some, some headband company is going to write me an email after this, but <laughs> I haven't seen them prevent concussions. I'm sure they've got some research that shows it, but at my level, guys don't wear them right. preventatively. Um, I don't know if that's a cultural thing where they don't want to look like a guy who's soft or they don't want to look different, but I've had a number of guys wear them after a concussion because now they're acutely aware of having a concussion. And, I explained to my guys, it's a lot like a knee sleeve. This isn't going to stop your knee from twisting, but it's going to give you a little bit of support, a little bit of uh, protection, a little bit of a sense of what's going on with that body part. And, and I think the headbands can be a little bit like that as well. But, um, you know, they're, they're controversial. There are some youth leagues that mandate them, but I don't think it's stopping every concussion in those leagues because you're still falling down. You're still mm -hmm. hitting hard, immovable objects, whether that's a goalpost or an elbow or the ground. Um, so I, I think it doesn't stop all concussions. Um, and I, and I hope it doesn't give a false sense of security that now wearing that you can use your head like a battering ram. Cause that's, that's the worst thing. Don, you got any, um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not completely sold on them either. And, and, you know, I think with the youth leagues, they're starting to limit um, how much heading you can do or something like that. And I don't think there's enough evidence right now that shows that, um, heading causes concussions at all. I mean, there would be no way in, in my opinion, that you could stop, it'd be really hard to stop a contact practice without being able to do a lot of headers and especially in a game with the midfield. So um, for that purpose, I, I don't think they're going to be very effective. Um, you know, I think it's more, like I said, the education. And if you do have a history of concussions, you, you need to be um, on a higher level with them anyways, concerned about, you know, are they at their third concussion and we're pulling them for, you know, disqualifying them from play forever or, you know, depending, depending on how severe the last concussion was and everything like that. So anything different, Bobby? Well, like similar to what Darren said, the only time I've seen him is a guy who's had, you know, one or two or, and he's, He's kind of trying to grasp at anything that's going to protect him a little more. 
and and I've had them come ask me about it, what I think, and and I and I've always taken the stance of you know I'm not going to tell you you can't wear it, but I'm not going to tell you you have to wear it either. I mean, it's 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 purely up to them. I don't. I'm not sold that it really does much outside of what they're said, you know, the surface blows and you, know, you, you got to remember your head, your, your brain's still floating inside your skull. And when it slams against the wall of your skull, you're going to get a concussion. And you know, we, we have violent contact in, in, in our, in our game and it's, it's going to happen. But I mean, it, if, if a player feels more comfortable wearing it, as long as they're doing it properly, I don't see a problem with it. All right. Well, we have, uh gone well over what should have been 60 minutes we're right at 90 minutes now but that's quite all right uh great conversation that's what happens when you have experts they all bounce things off of each other so i am going to close it out um and in april i'm gonna come back to you and say what's your what's your biggest takeaway from today so think about that while i go through this next part all right all right so school school health has partnered with the sports medicine broadcast to give away a gift card every month to a listener um you know israel got it last month it was susan before that and then rachel who's been very active in the chat room today was the first person i'm pretty sure it's the same person there uh to receive the school health gift card so that's been really cool so if in november you want to uh, go to school sportshealth.com slash smb sportshealth.com slash smb where you can enter the code sarah and fill out that information there s-a-r-a-h is for november that's my beautiful wife december when it's going to be cold and wet and you don't want your kit getting wet you can use the code F O O B A G foo bag. Those are great. We used it this on our last football game. It, my whole body was soaked because my raincoat, my raincoat leaked, but my kit and all the stuff in that bag stay dry. So I would definitely recommend the foo bag. That's the December. And then for January, when this one actually will be released via podcast is G hats. Cause that's when we have our extra large student athletic trainer or student athletic training aid, whatever it is, workshop, uh, that, we have about 1,100 student, high school student athletic trainers there on one Saturday learning and just interacting. And it's a really cool event, and uh, I'm really glad to be a part of it. And they're also the ones that sponsor the CEU. So in January, you can use the code GHATS at sportshealth.com slash SMB. Now we're going to come back to April. April, your big takeaway from today. Um, I'm just very fortunate to be in a room with three experts on um, athletic training and injuries. I'm taking a rehabilitation class, so knowing what each person does and does the same and different at the same time um, is very beneficial for my education. All right, fantastic. And so if you want to check out the website, sportsmedicinebroadcast.com, I got links to everything. I'll have links to the show notes, the podcast, the YouTube videos, all that stuff will be there on sportsmedicinebroadcast.com where typically every Wednesday we're live, but this one uh, we had to fit into Bobby's schedule and Theron's schedule. So um, it, it's, it is what it is, but we obviously we had pretty active chat room today. So that was great. Again, Rob to John, Christy Keeler, John Prosek, Rachel. Um, I think it's Rachel Blakeman, John Sieco, Checo. Uh, I'm sorry, John, uh, Israel Motan Montano, and Alexandra Blenis. Thanks for joining us there in the chat room and being part of the, the live process. Um, I'm, I'm on Twitter a whole lot, PHS Sports Med. So for Jeremy, let me switch over to Bobby real quick. Bobby, you can say goodbye. Goodbye. Thank you. And thanks All for right. having me. It's been great. Sure. And then Don, <laughs> Theron, and April. And that is a wrap. So... All right, great job, great job. That's good. So it'll be just a second before I get everything stopped, so. Oops.